This is our very last talk in our summer programme of virtual events. Um, I'd like to express how grateful we are for all the help and generosity of parents, colleagues and alumni across our community, without whom this wonderful programme would not have even been possible. Thanks to all of you too for joining us today. Your generous donations at registration for Johnny's two events have helped raise over 500 pounds for our bursaries appeal, which is a key part of our Inspiring Minds campaign. And this year saw a significant growth in the numbers applying for bursaries throughout the school. So we are delighted that our appeal will be able to fund five new bursaries from September. Your continued support and help has made this happen. Um, it's so, so appreciated, thank you. Okay, a few house rules. Everyone will be on mute so you can all hear the presentation clearly, but please feel free to type your questions in the chat facility throughout the talk and send to all to avoid duplication of questions. Johnny will answer as many of these as he can both during and after the talk. So turning to this Lunchtime's programme, we are delighted to welcome Latimer's Head of History, Johnny White. Johnny had a career in publishing after university before turning his hand to English language and then history teaching. He has taught in both state and the independent sectors, as well as in Egypt for four years. Today, Johnny will uh, offer a brief historical overview of liber liberalism's debt to Christianity. And on that note, Johnny, over to you. And thank you very much for the for the introduction. You probably should also have said I'm a cultural Anglican atheist, which is something I have to declare, I think, with such a, you know, a, a provocative, deliberately provocative title I've chosen um, for this uh, talk. I'm going to start off, though, with a clip here that hopefully you can see. This is a wonderful uh, Stephen Pinker, um, a, a, a prominent uh, a humanist um, who is answering this question, has science, reason, and humanism replaced faith? Event of any kind. And obviously in the book you make the case that uh, science, reason, and humanism are largely responsible for, for this progress. Um, to what extent though do you see Christianity, religion in general, as being a help or a hindrance in, in the progress? Well, it, it depends on whether you're referring to the beliefs of the institutions. Uh, the beliefs, I think, are, are a hindrance. I think that uh, any kind of supernatural belief, as opposed to our best scientific understanding of reality, uh, can't possibly help. Uh, if you believe that disease is the result of uh, divine punishment, or that uh, curing it is a result of intercessory prayer, then that's clearly not going to make any progress towards global health. Uh, if you think that um, God would not let bad things happen to the planet, so we don't have to worry about man-made climate, kind of belief that is just literally uh, not, not true, not, or at least not true to the best of our understanding. Now, uh, likewise, I think a belief in um, a valuation of souls as opposed to lives uh, is, is not helpful because it implies that our time on earth is just an infinitesimal portion of our existence, that if you send someone off to heaven, you might be doing them a favor. If uh, someone is uh, perhaps seducing people into eternal damnation, then they're a uh, public health menace and they ought to be neutralized for the greater good of all. So I think there's a, a large set of supernatural beliefs that we're much better off abandoning. But the institutions, but the institutions though, uh, as institutions evolve, including religious institutions, including some but not all Christian denominations. And if uh, institutions, I think largely under the uh, influence of uh, enlightenment values, back off from the literal supernatural beliefs, back off from the um, the, the uh, Iron Age morality in, in uh, a lot of the uh, Old Testament, such as uh, uh, capital punishment for homosexuals, um, and uh, begin to align their goals with, with uh, humanistic ones, then... Uh, then... So, um, the, that's the bit, uh, Stephen Pinker, who's in um, the same tradition, I think, of, of what has come to be called the new uh, atheist movement. Um, and it's very hard to disagree with um, a lot of what is said there in terms of how progressive liberalism, humanism has overthrown and replaced religious faith and, 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 and Christianity particularly. And he sees how humanism uh, advances um, every meter that it advances 
with enlightening science, of course, in the vanguard, that our religious attachments um, retreat. And there's a direct and proportionate relationship, you know, that as the beating waves of irrefutable um, science and the universal truths of, of, of reason kind of weather these superstitions, um, then the false claims of, of, of real, revealed religion are shown for what they are, which is kind of uh, falsehood. Now, um, <coughs> he is not, of course, um, a, a historian, and neither is anyone there. Dawkins is Richard Dawkins isn't, Christopher Hitchens isn't either. Um, of course, as a Canadian working in Harvard, Stephen Pinker works uh, in the USA, where he has useful idiots uh, uh, within the creationist Christian right um, and Old Testament literalists in the Bible Belt to give him the straw men that he might need. But um, there's something about um, characterizing um, the legacy of Christianity as Iron Age morality, as he puts it, which I think ignores really um, where we get where liberals get a lot of our moral assumptions, um, how they've become ingrained, how they've become second nature, so second nature to us that many, uh, as I'm going to argue, uh, uh, we, we, that we can abandon uh, much of the trappings and the supernatural, of course, all of that belief around that ethical world, but yet somehow it's still with us that nothing uh, comes from nothing. I think if pressed, um, A.C. Grayling, certainly a uh, philosopher, not a historian, Christopher Hitchens would say that our ethical life comes from two main sources. And they really latch on to the historical schema that's essentially the inheritance of Gibbon. Edward Gibbon, in his uh, account, brilliant account, of course, of the decline of, and notice the nostalgia, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where he sees it basically after the Theodician Code is introduced in the fourth century, the Nicene Creed is introduced, pagans are persecuted, that from the conversion of Rome to Christianity followed a mixture of error and corruption, which religion brought to earth among a weak and degenerate um, race of beings. And so the scheme is essentially light, then darkness, the Middle Age, which we're coming to see to be the Middle Age by the Renaissance, and then enlightenment, the age of science and reason, uh, where we can essentially throw out, slough off um, the Middle Age. And um, David Hume, uh, the great enlightenment philosopher, essentially said to one of his tutors, what a waste of time uh, learning all of that Christian theology. If only, he says, here he is next to um, the School of Athens. Um, what a waste of time. If only I had Cicero put in my hands when I was a child, it would have saved a lot of time. And Raphael's School of Athens here with all of the great philosophers are, the, of course, what the Enlightenment uh, reveres. The classical world is benign, rational, overthrown by the superstition of irrational Christianity. And that inheritance is still alive and well. And here's a book that came out a couple of years ago by uh, Catherine Nixie, um, which is a modern iteration, really, of, of Gibbon. And it's a depiction of early Christian monks smashing up pagan idols and closing down academies and shutting temples and so on. Um, and incidentally, Catherine Nixie is also a, a, a journalist. And, and, and this hasn't been well received by historians. I mean, Professor, don't take my word for it, uh, his Professor Dame Avril Cameron, who's Professor of Ancient History at Oxford, and she says there's very little archaeological evidence of the destruction um, of uh, classical temples. We're more struck by its, the adaptation of them. Here's the, the uh, Temple of Isis at Philae with a Christian cross, of course, taking the form of the Ankh, the Egyptian symbol, carved onto Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, <coughs> just as says um, uh, uh, Professor Cameron, we're actually more struck by how the early Christian fathers, I put Augustine probably at the top of this list, how they adopt Hellenistic philosophy, absorb Hellenistic philosophy, uh, rather than uh, turn their back on it. So that's the first source of uh, where I think um, 
uh, Dawkins and, and Grayling would say, we get our ethics, we really get them from the classical world, we don't get them from Christianity at all. The second source of hu uh, that humanists would say we get our sort of ethical life from is what we might call our common humanity. And this is famously uh, argued by Thomas Paine, of course, in the 18th century, who Christopher Hitchens reveres, um, where Paine basically argues that our notion of right and wrong is engraved on our heart, he says. It is common sense. It is our common humanity, um, which essentially is in line with the Stoic philosophies of the Greeks or synidesis, the idea of conscience. We have this internal referee um, uh, uh, that, that can tell us what we're doing is, is, is right and what we're doing is wrong. Now, of course, this argument that common sense sort of comes from nothing has I think probably two problems, um, which is, of course, firstly, that it's, it's not at all um, incompatible with what Paul, who's as a, as a, as a, as a Hellenized, Greek-speaking Pharisee, well aware of Stoic philosophers, is saying to the Corinthians, where the Corinthians are, um, are, are saying, you know, do we have to get circumcised? Do we have to know the law to be um, you know, to morally good, and how is it that there are bad Jews and that there are good Gentiles? And Paul is saying, all right, and he says this to the Romans, when Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they're a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law, even though they're not Jews. It is written in their hearts, he says. Um, he's distancing himself from Moses finding the tablet of stone. He's deliberately saying, I'm not Moses. This is not revealed religion. I haven't gone up a mountain and, and, and been told what we are to do. It's actually there. Now, there might be all sorts of reasons why Paul wants to say this, but nevertheless, you can, you can obey the law, he says, without knowing the law. Um, and and this, this evolves into the doctrine of the circumcision of the heart. And so Paine's actually building here in this idea of common sense, common humanity, he's building on a, a, on a precept which is absolutely central to what Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And this notion of Christian conscience echoes down the ages through Martin Luther, of course, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, and, and so on. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and so therefore when I see something like um, the uh, Pinker, much though I, I adore Stephen Pinker and, 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 and hoovered up Christopher Hitchens' work, it just, it just doesn't sound, doesn't seem, doesn't quite sit rightly when we're in a society in which our great hospitals are after all medieval foundations built upon a middle-aged piety, a middle-aged uh, you know, St. Bartholomew, St. Thomas's, a, middle, a, a medieval sense of duty uh, to the poor, uh, sorry, to, to the sick to be found in um, St. Matthew, um, wh wh where um, uh, we, wh the church easily outflanks the left on what we should do with people who are homeless. Yeah, they, they should be uh, w welcomed. Where um, uh, we are literally taking the knee, where liberals are taking the knee, incidentally, an affirmation of uh, in, in, uh, I read on the BLM website, uh, it, it, Martin Luther King in 1965 stopped on a march for prayer. And, and this is why it's become um, such a sort of, you know, a, 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 um, great symbol of um, the B, B, BLM movement. And, and, and the idea of false idols and, and how false idols can be um, a an obstruction to, 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 the, to the truth. So here's the golden calf being pulled down. And is it, is it only sort of a, you know, the, the need to pull down Edward Colston? I, I think it just comes from somewhere and it can't be simply disregarded as, you know, um, a, a contingent or, 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 or happenstance. There's something in us, I think, culturally, that when we see a statue that we think is a false idol, um, that it has to come down as it, had, as it had to come down in the Reformation when saints pulled down in Edwardian era, 
uh, as the golden calf is pulled down um, as well. And, and, and the other thing that sort of didn't quite sit easily, I think, is, is if, if we believe the, 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 the economist uh, as to their democracy index, which is basically calculated by um, how human rights and the notion in individual human rights are best um, expressed in the law, that map where the dark green is the full democracy is, is kind of overwhelmingly, um, overwhelmingly Protestant culture uh, and, and, and lesser Catholic culture, but certainly Protestant culture, which is my hunch that Protestantism is really liberalism with a lot of the supernatural and revealed stuff stripped away. Um, it's been sloughed off like a kind of snake skin, um, but, but nevertheless, we, 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 we possibly don't acknowledge it or, or, or maybe even don't want to um, acknowledge it. So um, that's uh, uh, a, a starting point. Does anyone want to um, say anything about, about that? And maybe, Jim, anyway, I can't see the chat, so. There's nothing in the chat at the moment. If anybody okay. would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, please do. Not. Okay, I'll press on. Uh, that's great. I wasn't expecting such an easy ride so far. Uh, right, great. Thank you. So um, here, here's, a, here, here's a wonderful book uh, by, by Larry Seedentop, who um, locates the invention uh, of, of, of the individual and, 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 and individual in the doctrine of, of the passion. And in classical, uh, the, the overthrow, actually, indeed, of uh, classical antiquity. Um, and his starting point, and Tom Holland is also his book, his starting point is also this. The classical world was, of course, um, a slave society in which Aristotle said that slaves were living tools. Um, Aristotle's idea of our equality, of course, is that, is, is that women and, and slaves don't, don't, don't qualify for citizenship, that equality is only for those of equal status. And this is a society where, of course, Caesar boasts of his conquest of Gaul. I've killed a million, I've enslaved a million, and gets a ticketate reception in Rome. This is a society in which its form of entertainment is the exotic sight of, of slaves hacking each other to death. Now, in the hands of Gibbon, Here's Charles Fox, thanks to my wife for this reference, thank you, Natasha. Uh, Charles Fox in his Roman toga. In the 18th century mind, he's a great liberal, Charles Fox. The, the classical world is close to us. We're not so different to them. We can, we can you know, when we're memorialized in London, we expect to be wearing a Roman toga. That middle age thing kind of got in the way. But I'm not sure. I think the classical world feels very, very distant um, to us it feels very, very distant, enlightenment or no enlightenment. And, and, and we come back, I think, to the whole message of the cross itself and the crucifixion story and why St. Paul's letters are like this sort of benign software virus to the claims of the Roman Caesars. Because the whole point about the crucifixion story is that the cross itself is the ultimate symbol of the power of the Roman state. It's the instrument of torture for the worst criminals, and the worst criminals, of course, rebellious slaves. And so therefore, Jesus is actually suffering the death of a slave. And he, hanging from his cross, he's being dangled from the billboards of imperial power. And what Paul is actually doing is he's actually saying to the Romans, you have put God to death. Now, of course, he's borrowing from classical heritage where he's calling Jesus the son of God. There's no evidence that Jesus claimed that for himself. But the reason that it's so revolutionary, um, this idea of the suffering servant who lived the life of the slave, but was in fact the son of God, is, of course, it's completely subversive because humans make sacrifices to appease gods. And this is an inversion. God has made a sacrifice to humans to raise them. 
Um, and this, this message, of course, electrifies the tanners and the workshops, the prostitutes and the bar, bars, maybe the slaves and the galleys. Because the, the whole message is, of course, not only that, that, that God shares your suffering, but there is redemption um, in suffering. Um, and in this sense, it, it invents a sort of a universal individualism. Because what God is actually doing is in, he's inventing a new covenant. He's saying, okay, this, this, this God of the Jews is no longer just the God of the Jews. This God is a God of all uh, humanity. This is the new covenant. There is neither Jew nor Greek, man nor woman, crucially, master or slave, as you're one in Christ. It's a universal message of the equality of all souls, absolutely foundational to all liberalism, the quality of all souls. Um, and he's saying, um, of course, uh, in, uh, he, he has probably borrowed this from Stoicism. There's no doubt about that, the cosmopolitan ideas of of stoicism um, and uh, it's just incredibly subversive because he's saying that um, this law is inscribed on your hearts and um, it's subversive as well because ultimately at the time that he's writing to the Romans there is a cult of the son of God and that's Augustus Caesar uh, because why? Because Augustus is the adopted son of the dead Julius Caesar. And that's the biggest cult that's growing in Rome at, at the time. Imperial power being underwritten by divine status. But in Paul's hands, he's saying, no, the emperor isn't the son of God. Um, the, the son of God is actually a carpenter who you've put to death um, in, in Palestine. Um, so therefore the victim is sacralized uh, by by Paul and um, the cross then is 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 a symbol of the dignity of suffering God chose the weak to shame um, the strong now of course after the conversion of Rome the cross then becomes a symbol of state power but now appropriated by the emperors um, here is um, the Christ Pantocrator in Byzantine art and it's hard not to see the emperor there of course uh, holding uh, the word sorry this is actually in in Kefalu Cathedral in Sicily Christ looking all the world like a Byzantine emperor and and, and more sinisterly of course therefore um, the cross is turned into a symbol of subjection it's usurped uh, and perverted to its exact antithesis as a, as a symbol of, um, of, of oppression. Um, and, and that's wonderfully put in, 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 in Gilea in, in, in The Handmaid's Tale as well, the perversion in this Christian Republic of the message of religion, which Margaret Atwood, I read her, what she said, had to say about it, which said it was not, wasn't the critique of religion, but the critique of the usurpation of religion to veil um, uh, dictatorships and I really recommend um, again a new atheist author who's wonderful Philip uh, Pullman's book um, The Good Man Jesus and he invents this brother scoundrel Christ the good man Jesus does, has no claims to be the son of God he's a moral teacher he scorns earthly power but his brother who's a PR guy can say all right I can see how we can set up a church and create a new kind of dominion here. Um, and, and, and so consequently, it's a parable. Pullman's book's a parable about how the church comes to then wield temporal, uh, temporal power. Um, now, with that in mind, Christianity had within itself the power of and the calling of reformatio, the impulse to uh, skin itself back to the founding principles, the original principles, which St. Paul calls the you know, newness of life or, 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 or the rebirth, the promise, the promise of, of, of the passion. Um, and it's undoubtedly true that the Christian sects, rather than the secularized humanists, um, were the prime movers, I would say, um, in the abolition 
of slavery um, as, as, uh, as well. I mean, certainly they've been inspirations, of course, for, um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to, from, I think they've been inspirations for political movements as well. So um, the uh, uh, French revolutionaries, his uh, Camille uh, um, Desmoulins, uh, the Jacobins, for all their dechristianization, see the original uh, Christ uh, as, as a sans culotte, as, as, as one of them. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 the sort of um, myth around Jesus suffering a, a slave's death was central to how um, slavery was abolished itself. Um, the Valladolid debate of 1550 uh, was participated in by a Dominican friar called uh, Bartolome de las Casas, who uses the term los derechos humanos, the idea of, of, of human rights, which we're told by Seedentop, uh, natural law is invented, it was developed in canon law, Catholic law, uh, in the 12th and 13th century. And de las Casas argues at Valladolid that it's wrong, it's in, in contrary to God's law to enslave Indians. All the peoples of the world are human uh, and each one is rational. They are equal moral agents. The idea that there's no master uh, nor slave. And that of course is developed uh, into, um, uh, here, here we have uh, de las Casas. And that then is developed principally by uh, Quakers, most famously um, William Penn, the English Quaker who was given a charter to found a new state in Pennsylvania. He chooses as the name of his capital, Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. And his eldest son, John Penn, abolished slavery in Pennsylvania. It's offensive, says Penn and the eyes of God, for all are one nation in Christ. Now, slave owners adapt and adopt, of course, Old Testament stories of slave ownership, but it's actually Quaker conscience that finally does for it. Um, here's the treaty uh, that, the, that Penn signed with the Laj Indians, which Voltaire admitted uh, was neither sworn to uh, nor never broken. Um, but then uh, in the 19th century, principally through groups like the uh, Clapham sect, it's undoubtedly the case and ignored by uh, Christopher Hitchens accounts that it's Quaker conscience essentially that, um, that, 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 that uh, uh, gives the energy to the slave trade movement. In 1834, British Parliament is petitioned by a quarter of the electorate, um, mobilized by radical Protestant sects to finally abolish slavery um, in the, the British colonies. That, that's at a time of the most intense Victorian um, piety. And this radiates out into the Islamic world. So for example, the Ottomans who are enslaving Circassians, of course, in the 1840s, the British ambassador goes to see Murad V, um, and puts it to the Sultan of Turkey um, that he should consider stopping uh, enslaving Circassians. Uh, um, and when Murad V quotes the Quran back to um, the British ambassador, of course, you know, how can how can um, uh, society subsist without slavery? This is absurd. No, 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 no economy has ever done. The ambassador then draws on Corinthians. He says that the idea of that the Quran has to be read, not according to the letter, but the spirit of the law. He uses St. Paul's notion that there is a distinction between what commands are mandated in the Quran and what is the transcendental spirit that illumines the heart in the Quran, which of course is compassion to those, compassion to the, the, to, to, to the victim, and ultimately wins the argument. The Ottomans finally um, cave in. Uh, and for all its wonderful polemic, this is, I think, ignored by, um, this, this, this is ignored by Christopher Hitchens in the civil rights movement as well, where 
the civil rights movement's foundation story for many black Americans was of course the story of Moses' exodus, Moses', Moses release and leading the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, which the spirituals themselves testify to. Um, and it's the formation of the black church and the Christianization of slaves that actually in the end sows the seeds of the destruction of this ghastly human institution. And not for nothing, not for nothing is Martin Luther King named by his parents after the great reformer. Now, Christopher Hitchens in his book just says his namesake, he doesn't, doesn't probe that. He doesn't probe into why is Martin Luther King named after the greatest reformatio maker, uh, Martin Luther. But what, what Martin Luther King is doing is he's cashing in on the check um, because the doctrine of the crucified slave echoes down the ages in, in, in Christian culture. And his target audience is, of course, Baptist ministers. It's not those in the North. He, he, he's really saying, I'm holding you to account. This, this is what Christian doctrine is. Much like um, all, all of the, the, the claims made we, we now have for black lives or for, or, or, or for immigrants, they are, they are made to appeal to people's consciences that have to be there. Um, uh, if, if those consciences aren't there, these pleas, of course, um, are without any power at all. So this is the most powerful myth of all. And it absolutely, of course, um, this, this, the, the, the image of the, 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 you know, the creator creating Adam and Eve in this common ancestry in which Adam and Eve are created in the image um, of God is ultimately the myth that enrages the Nazis. The act says God has made of one blood all nations. Now, again, I mean, in the hands of, <laughs> in the hands of Richard Dawkins, in the hands of uh, Christopher Hitchens, the Genesis story is ludicrous because it's creationist. Um, of course. Uh, it's not science. It's, of course it's ridiculous. But I don't think that that's what really threatens the Nazi view of racial hierarchy. It's the, it's the notion that somehow every race is in descent from Adam and Eve, which then puts all races on, on a basis of, 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 common, of common humanity. Um, it enraged Nietzsche, helping and caring for the poor, um, uh, uh, again, I've sort I've lost my my um, my link, but you can read it whilst I do. Um, has um, uh, it, it, it is itself, of course, uh, links to this uh, secondary notion that um, Darwin's thought is really, really threatening to the church, church not so much because, um, you know, we descended from Nape, although of course that, that did exercise some bishops and so on. But it's more the idea that the implications of his theory, which is, this is what bothered um, uh, Darwin, was that it would call time. He, he feared that somehow, that, 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 that because his science had shown that um, God's universal natural law was indeed apparently what his cousin called the survival of the fittest, that this would then have implications for the way we view the, the weak and the poor that could be very, very dangerous. And indeed they were, weren't they, um, with eugenics and so on. Um, uh, as Hitler uh, said, Christianity was the heaviest blow that ever was dealt to humanity because of his um, battles with the church over eugenics and sterilization, which interfered with Darwinian, Darwinian law. So um, I think in this clearly, we, we kind of um, side, don't we, uh, with Christian doctrine against this Nietzschean um, fascist view of how the 
universe is actually set upon these the law of nature which means that it's somehow unnatural to look after those uh, look after the victim whereas christianity i've argued sacralizes the victim um, uh, uh, so nietzsche would side with reddit and breitbart and the kind of noxious wing of the right which call what we've got at the moment um, victim culture and they quote you know covert revengefulness when petty envy becomes master as nietzsche said um, whereas I think in liberal culture now, uh, we would say that, that, that being a victim can be a source of strength. It can be a source of a narrative and, 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 and it can, um, that, 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 that therefore there is nobility in um, uh, appealing to, uh, well, f first I suppose in suffering, but, but, but also that, that that also gives the sufferer an authority um, with those in our society to make those claims. Um, right, so is this the case then that in fact um, uh, that you know it, it, in, in ancient Rome if you were to say everyone is of equal worth um, and I'm a victim, um, Tom Holland's in his brilliant book Dominion says well what would the Romans do they'd, they'd laugh at you and say well I will enslave you and I would argue that the Christian revolution has still uh, reverberates down the ages and that actually human rights um, are somehow derived from the heritage this this Christian heritage and it exists not despite Iron Age morality that uh, possibly before because of it and the social liberalism evidently derives from it. I mean here are great philanthropists Elizabeth Fry, Quaker, William Booth, Methodist, Henry Wellcom, Adventist, Thomas Bernardo, mixed Sephardic Jewish father, Plymouth Brethren, mum. <laughs> uh, mum is a Plymouth Plym Brethren and it, these social liberals are chapel going uh, dissenters and they lay the foundations you could argue um, for what we might call social liberalism. So would anyone like to comment on any of that? <laughs> because I've gone on quite a lot. So yeah, uh, could I comment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, probably just to agree with most of it. I think when you think about the 19th century and the rise of chartism, uh, trade unionism, um, you've talked about some of the charitable works. Think about Dickens and highlighting the plight of the poor and lots of those social reformers, William Booth is obvious candidate. And I think that it's always struck me that actually without Christianity, a lot of what we would call liberal progress would never have been made. But I think on the other side, you've got to say, and maybe this is your, this is your um, evil Christ figure, that the church has also aligned itself. The institutions of Christianity have often aligned themselves with, with what we would re regard as reactionary um, and in some cases despotic regimes. Yeah. So, you can pick your way, you can pick your argument on either side, actually. I, I, I do go along with a lot of your uh, parallels of liberalism. That's a shame. I was hoping you'd disagree with me, Greg. Yeah, I'm trying to. Come on, someone must. <laughs> um, hi, hi there. Um, it occurred to me, um, I, to what extent do you think some of the great sort of human rights activists of the past uh, used religion as a cloak, you know, it gave them respectability, it made it harder for um, governments to attack them. Um, in the same way, rather, that it occurred to me, you know, Soviet dissidents in the sort of 60s yeah. on used environmentalism um, as a cloak for actually wider concerns. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's not comfortable being a dissenter in Victorian Britain. It's much more comfortable to be in the, in, in the, in the lukewarm C of E. You know, they're outsiders. And you can argue that that's, that 
possibly is where a lot of this reforming impulse actually comes from. They're the leading secularists, and I might come on to that later. You know, who invents secularism? Dissenters. Mm -hmm. It suits them. Non they don't want an established church. It's threatening to them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm restricting our focus on, on England and America because it's too big otherwise, and I don't really know what would, would be true of France and Italy and so on. But I don't think it's because um, I, th I think that if you look at someone like Elizabeth Fry uh, or Wedgwood or someone like that, they're, they're, it, 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 this drive uh, is definitely <coughs> coming from their reading of nonconformity. English socialists overwhelmingly Methodist. It's essentially a Methodist. It owes far more to Methodism than Marxism, as we all write essays about university. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jesus was the first Methodist, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and that gets lost, I think, in, in, in the accounts of the DNA of early English socialism and, and liberalism. Shall I carry Hello. on? Yeah, someone else. Yeah, David. Oh. Who, me? Yeah. Was it you, David? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I just wondered, I think, I think you made the point that you said there was something positive about um, victimhood. Yeah. C could you just amplify that slightly? D dignity, dignity in it. Uh, well, yeah. uh, I, I, I think that is this true that in, in contemporary liberal culture, you're on a much better footing if you can show that you've been disadvantaged, dis un un unprivileged, that you have been the victim, that you have um, suffered in some how, uh, I would say more than when I was little. Um, now, I don't know whether that, you know, you can, you can you know, put that down to an advance in humanism or whether it's derivative of Christian culture and the, and, and, and the passion and, and the suffering servant and so on. I don't know. I'm making an assertion, but I'm suggesting <laughs> that the reason we're receptive to it is because of the saturation of hundreds of years of sitting on the knee, listening to the mother recite, for example, the parable of the lost sheep or the Good Samaritan. You, you, you just can't ignore that. It, it, you know, in, in A.C. Grayling's if you ask a philosopher, they're going to say it comes from Greek philosophy. How many Stoic philosophers can you name? Who's reading Stoic philosophy in these 16th, 17th, 18th? No, I mean, only eggheads in universities. The, 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 the cultural values are learned on the mother's knee. They're, they're learned in the chapel. They're learned at Sunday school. And they just become so second nature. So second nature. In fact, I'm going to show you something that... Uh, I, I hope illustrates this. Um, am I still sharing? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Think of religious doctrine and law and the church as kind of calipers helping the leg form, helping the leg form into a, you know, a properly functioning limb. And then forgive me for showing Forrest Gump um, here. What happens? Sorry, that was really, really cheesy. Uh, but I hope, hopefully you take the point. Um, do you take the point? <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm woefully ignorant of you know, the world religions, but if I were Buddhist or Muslim, wouldn't I um, be saying, you know, in our, in our uh, traditions too, you know, children yeah. learn to be kind to the poor and the sick and so on, you know, from an early age, that's ingrained in oh, particularly, our uh, religions yeah. also. Absolutely. 
absolutely. This is not exclusive. Uh, I, I have to restrict you know, what I'm saying to, 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 to Christendom. So this isn't exceptionalism at all. Um, but I think I'm right that that uh, the, 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 the humanist society in, in the UK's particular target would be, um, you know, the heritage, the Christian heritage, rather than uh, Islam and Buddhism. I, I will move on that to, to, with the time we have left, I will say something about secularism, because I think that this, this probably is unique to uh, Christian heritage in a way that it, it, I, I would argue can't be in Islam, precisely because the prophet was a ruler and a lawmaker, uh, whereas you know Jesus was, of course, a rebel and uh, and and a revolutionary. So, um, can you? Am I still share? Am I still sharing? Yeah, um, yeah. 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 I, I think most liberals would say um, that uh, they're secularists, and and, and I'm going to argue that that secularism really is only conceivable, or at least it finds its origin, um, as we understand it, uh, in uh, Christian roots. Now, I, I've already hinted that what all sectarians had um, in common, especially the especially true of the USA um, and the and, and 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 the First Amendment, is the idea of the separation of church from state. Now, um, it, it only really makes sense if you think about it um, historically. Um, here is. Uh, 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 Cromwell saying um, that uh, even in his godly protectorate there's a paradox um, in that do I, do I impose severe legal disabilities on those who are teaching um, what I regard as um, false religion um, and in fact um, what Cromwell noticed was that when he exiled an anti-Trinitarian uh, and mutilated a Quaker for impersonating Christ, in fact, it was counterproductive that the social peace can't be maintained in a religiously pluralistic society if the sword, Caesar, Cromwell, enforces religion, uni religious uniformity. So despite his popular reputation, Cromwell doesn't invent tolerance, but certainly practices it. I mean, he supped with papists. Um, Israel Ben Massa, the, the, the Jewish rabbi, uh, was allowed back into England with his co-religionists, ending hundreds of years of exile. Um, and the key development then, after the restoration, was and the Commonwealth had crumbled and the Stuart monarchy was restored, was Parliament's reaction to the prospect of James II, Charles's brother, as a crypto Catholic, then um, a, 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 an avowed Catholic, on the throne. And this created um, a major challenge for ideas of relationship between um, governmental power in England and. Uh, religion and private right of religion. And John Locke's treatise is foundational to modern liberalism because basically he argues that you can rightfully overthrow the sovereign, which was what the 1688 revolution was. Um, this is a liberal notion of the right of resistance to tyranny. You can rightfully overthrow the sovereign. And here's the point. When can you? In what, in, 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 what, in what circumstances? And he says, it's when the practice of religions that interfere with the free exercise of religion, um, that is when you, that is, you can suppress open and public forms of Catholic authority. Why? Because it will offend and stop the religious practice of non-Catholics. So therefore, what this says, the act of toleration basically says, is that um, you tolerate all religions so long as they don't interfere with everyone's right to practice religion. Now, 
in the late 18th century, that meant the Catholics had to worship at home, but so, so long as it was at home behind closed doors, that ultimately was acceptable. And so consequently, this is the formation, foundation of what comes to be called secularism. Now, what's misunderstood, I think, often is secularism is not something that comes with the decline of religious attachment. In fact, it's the precise reverse. Secularism is necessary when arguably religiosity at it, is at its very, very, very height. It's when religion matters so much that it can literally uh, destroy and rip, and rip apart societies as in, as in the wars of religion, then um, it is essential to tolerate. Um, and and that, that toleration has to be founded um, in, in the law. And Voltaire said, Voltaire looked at England and he said, um, you know, in France, we've only got two or three religions and we, we, we repress, we, re we try to repress the other two. But in England, you've got 35. And that's to everyone's benefit. There are so many different versions of it that um, it inclines us to um, toleration. And then that, that I think emerges out of um, uh, that, 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 that emerges out of uh, St. Paul's doctrine of rendering, you know, where, where, sorry, I should say Jesus, when Jesus is asked, should I pay taxes to Rome? Uh, the idea is that you should render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And that notion of the earthly and the spiritual, the division of the, the temporal world and the spiritual world is then um, developed by St. Augustine in the city of God in the fifth century and developed even further probably uh, by Gregory the seventh in the 11th century in the investiture crisis. And then after the Reformation, it's, it, it deepens even further into what we ultimately call, um, you know, the, the toleration within a secular, um, secular setting. And what is the, what is the, the logic of that? The logic of that is, look, if the conscience, if consciences can't be forced, if as St. Paul says, our, our ministry is not written with ink, but the spirit of the living God, can you then expect MPs who are atheists to make an oath to God? Here's Charles Bradlaugh, it's now 1880s, and he's just about to be arrested because he won't make an oath to God to take his seat as MP in Parliament. But what does Gladstone's Parliament have to do? The logic of this is that if a conscience can't be bound by ink, that's to say if I'm told to swear something and I just swear it, it's worthless. And therefore, the first atheist is allowed to sit in the House of Commons by making an affirmation rather than an oath. And so actually, uh, ultimately, um, what the Toleration Act has done in this setting is it has in fact created the context within which atheists uh, sit alongside uh, nonconformists, this is the logic of it, alongside Anglicans and Catholics uh, on, an equal, on an equal basis. Um, and Charles probably is the, the, is, is the inheritor of that. Does anyone want to say anything about that? Because I pretty much have worked out that that might be my full time. You haven't said much about religion, uh, about education and how that might have um, played into the whole thing. Because if you, if you look back to the dissenters in the um, 18th century, a lot of material was being produced for children. I mean, lots of children learned to read through the Bible eventually, eventually or in, certainly in the country, but, but um, in middle class um, schools, yeah. um, children was, were still very much getting the, the, the God message. <laughs> yeah. And arguably through the 19th century, even though there were alternatives. So uh, would you like to just sort of say something about, about that? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. When you say the God message, we would, we would say from modern secular humanist perspective, not necessarily the one that we think is liberal or helpful or humane. Is that what you mean? 
Well, I just mean, you, you were talking about it being ingrained in our society and yeah. that sort of second nature. And I yeah. think a lot of it comes from, you know, sort of early, early uh, education. Yes. No, I think you're absolutely right. So that even if you disagree with it later, it's there. It's, yeah. it's bedrock of your education, even for our generation. Yes. Um, you know, although not all schools were Christian schools or church schools, you still were brought up as Christians. Absolutely. <laughs> um, quite, um, quite a lot of what I, the examples I've chosen it, have been um, sort of pinched from Tom Holland's book, <laughs> Dominion, which I really, really recommend. I think it's, it's fabulous. And, and when you read it, you'll see quite how secondhand um, this talk has been. Uh, but nevertheless, I'd be interested to see when I meet you in, in conversation later on, how much you agree with him when he says that essentially liberal myths like human rights, that human rights is ultimately a myth. I mean, you know, I didn't sign a contract. You didn't sign a contract. Um, it's certainly human rights haven't been discovered scientifically. They don't exist anywhere. We can't see them in a telescope or identify them under a microscope. They're common beliefs. Um, and up to a point, they can be enforced in courts. But, but he, he uses the word myth. And of course, in his hands, he says, these myths probably have been handed down. Now, I haven't said enough about how St. Paul, of course, imbibes Greek philosophy of course incorporates Sinaiticis and the idea of conscience from the Stoics. He would have known about, you know, the idea of cosmopolitanism and the equality of, of individuals within Stoicism. Certainly all of that's true. But as Leslie's just said, the stories and the myths and the services and the observances and the saints days and, and all of that, which is happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, somehow I think doesn't go away. I think it, I think it somehow does infuse our, 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 our culture. So, so that's what I was trying to do today, was to redress this idea that somehow the lights are on until Augustus Caesar or until, until Constantine, and then they're switched off again. <laughs> and somehow they're switched back on again in the 18th century, and it's been hey presto ever since. I don't think um, uh, that's how the historical process works. Uh, nothing comes from nothing. And I don't think we lose anything as humanists, actually, uh, if, if you are one. I don't think you lose anything from acknowledging the saturation of the Judeo-Christian culture in our assumptions. Mm. So I, that's it, Joanna. I think, I think uh, looking at the time, we're done. Lovely. Thank you. Um, thank you millions actually Johnny that was both interesting and a fascinating lecture to end our series um, you may be interested in signing up for Johnny's new evening class also the great when a history of London through its architecture which starts in September Johnny will teach 10 lesson zoom course every Wednesday evening on the built history of the capital from Ro Roman Londinium to the present day to find out more or to sign up for a place, please head to our evening classes page on the website um, or there'll be a link in the chat. There's probably a number of links in the chat right now. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is the last event in our summer events programme. However, um, I am delighted to announce that the head, David Goodhue, has very kindly agreed this week to launch our new autumn virtual events programme with an evening talk um, giving a history of Latimer in 10 people on Tuesday the 8th of September. Um, please see our forthcoming events page on the website also, um, or follow the link to register for the events, that event or, or many others, um, which will be um, posted on the website during the course of this week. Um, if you've missed any of the events from this summer program, you can catch up with the, all the recordings now on our events video library. Oh, well, John is not quite now, but that will be up by tomorrow afternoon. Um, again, link is in the chat. Um, that brings us to the end of today's talk and to the summer series. So if you would like to copy any of those links, please do so now before I close this meeting. As always, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Johnny, for your inspiring talk. And I hope to see you all again in the awesome term. Goodbye. <laughs>